Pedro Venezuela from Universidade Federal do Fluminense, where he's going to talk about theoretical investigation of double resonant Raman spectroscopy in 2D materials. Please, Pedro. So if you have any question, please ask for the microphone. We are recording this presentation. So, so. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for the organizing, for inviting me here. Uh, it's my first time here at IIP, and uh, thank you for all coming uh, earlier, even though we have a very nice uh, evening yesterday night. Uh, well, I'm, I'm from uh, Fluminense University in Niterói, so I start to explaining, because when I, when I first moved to, to Niterói, I didn't know exactly what, why the university was called like that. Is, is, is it because of the soccer team? No, no, it's not. So if you look in Brazil, we have three states with naming names starting with Rio, which means river, of course. So we are here. So if, if you are from Rio Grande do Norte, you are a Potiguar. If you are from Rio Grande do Sul, you are a Gaúcho. The tricky question, if you are from, from the state of Rio de Janeiro, how how you were called? Because back then I, I thought the, the the answer was carioca, but carioca is, is if you are from the city of Rio de Janeiro. So actually, <coughs> fluming in in Latin is river. So that's the origin of the Fluminense words. So University Federal Fluminense is the federal university from the state of Rio de Janeiro. So we have a uh, uh, camp campuses in, in, in nine cities, and the main campus is in Niterói. And we don't, don't have any campus in the city of Rio de Janeiro. So here uh, is the city of Rio de Janeiro. If, we, if you take the bridge, here's the Guanabara Bay, and here is the Atlantic Ocean. If you take the bridge, you go to Niterói, and uh, you are, we are in, the, in a campus uh, here, so it's a very nice place to visit whenever you go to Rio, please uh, send me an email. I will, be I will be very happy to uh, receive you in our university. This is our our building in the, the physics institutes. Actually, this is an old picture because now we have an, another tower here that uh, we, we built uh, by the time the Brazilian government uh, I, I still had money to invest in university. Th th those times are gone, but they, but they will, they will come back, I'm sure. So uh, just sh showing you that they have a, a very nice view. Uh, and I, I will talk about uh, Roman spectroscopy, spe spe spectroscopy uh, from a, a, a theory point of view, but I would like to uh, spend a few words about this guy here. I cannot pronunciate his name, but uh, you can try. Uh, he had a very interesting life. I cannot talk too much, but uh, I, I, I want to talk a little bit about him. Uh, and when he, uh, sorry, when he was uh, 19, uh, 29 years old, he was hired by the University of Calcutta. He was already a very known scientist in India, and uh, he was becoming to, to be known also in Europe because of his several kinds of scientific works. Uh, but there was a, uh, at, at that time, he, he, he had not never uh, left India. And there was a, who, a law in India to be hired as a, a university pro pro professor. You should have some kind of training as a PhD student, for instance, uh, outside India. And he said, no, I don't need that. I'm already a good scientist. The people from Europe sh should, go, should come to India to learn with me. I don't need to go there. So they, they make an arrangement, and he went to this conference, the conference of the British Empire universities. Of course, at that time, uh, India w was part of the British Empire, 
So, uh, and then he, he, he gave a talk, and they, they said, no, that's okay, so now you can be a professor. When he was coming back by boat uh, from uh, UK to India, he was very astonished by the, the blue color of the Med Mediterranean uh, Ocean, and he became interested in student scattering of light. So he started studying scattering of light, uh, and he saw some interesting features. At, 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 some, at some point, he, he, thought, he, he, he thought that he was uh, measuring, measuring uh, something that he, 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 he would call weak flur fluorescence, but s at some point he realized that, uh, it, uh, that it was not fluorescence, it was something else. So he uh, proposed the, the, a new kind of uh, uh, scattering process that now we know as Raman scattering, and this may be the first Raman scattering ever published. It was in 1928, 100, uh, I mean, sorry, 91 years later. This is for liquid benzene. So this is the incident spectrum, and the scattering spectrum, you, you, sa you have the same wavelengths and some uh, uh, additional wavelength. So uh, immediately, the international scientific community uh, took attention to his work, and he, he became very, very famous. And by 90, uh, uh, one, uh, two, year, two years, one year, uh, no, two, two years later, uh, people said that these three guys were the candidates for the Nobel Prize. So it's not very difficult to beat these three guys, OK? So, but there are a, a fourth uh, uh, candidate who is Raman. So what he did, OK, I will win. He uh, uh, bought, uh, bought two boat ticks to Stockholm because he, uh, he was sure that he, that was his prize. And of course, he, he did win. So. <laughs> Uh, he was very confident. There. So uh, I'd like uh, I could talk more about him. He was the first uh, Asian to win the Nobel Prize, and he was also the f the first uh, person uh, 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 from uh, not a Caucasian uh, uh, person to, to win the, the the Nobel Prize in science. Okay, so he's uh, very he's impressive what he uh, what he d he did in his life. He. he he published very, very, he was very productive, productive scientifically until his the seventh, and uh, he had, had a very interesting life. So basically, uh, what's Raman scattering? You have a, a, a molecule or a solid, you shine light, and then you measure light, a different uh, kind of light. And in most of case, what you are doing, you are losing uh, energy from your photon to some uh, uh, the uh, vibration degree of freedom. So you can uh, uh, create uh, vibrations degree of freedom or annihilate them. So if you are creating, those are the Stokes modes, and if you are annihilating, you, you have the unstokes modes, and here you have uh, uh, Haley stack scattering, which is elastic scattering. So this is a kind of inelastic scattering. What is very ins interesting is that you can measure tho those vibration frequency, and these vibration frequencies are a fi fingerprint of the system you're, you're measuring. There, is there, there are no, no two solids or two, two mole molecules with exactly the same vibration frequency. So you can measure uh, uh, a lot of things. There are several, several applications for Raman scattering in physics, chemistry, uh, materials engineering, uh, bio stuff, uh, even in, in art, archaeology, uh, forensic uh, uh, science, criminal investigation. I could stay all my talk, talk uh, talking about applications, but I'll give just one application. So this is Anne Hathaway. I put her picture because she's a be beautiful and, and good actress. And in this movie here is a, if you want to eat some popcorn and enjoy yourself, it's not a big movie, but it's fun, so I recommend. She's wearing this necklace. And one of the questions of the, move, the, of the movie is, is this diamond or not? I, I, won't, I won't give you any spoiler, so, so be, be, it's okay. So. Uh, if you want to do, they, they, they don't, they, uh, just one spoiler, they don't use Raman in the movie, so <laughs> that's the only spoiler I will give today. So, but you could. 
You could use Raman to see that. This is the, the phono uh, uh, dispersion of diamond. And uh, the first thing important is uh, usually we use uh, light, in, in visible light, or maybe infrared or ultraviolet, but the, the wavelength of light is very large compared to the uh, lattice parameter of a solid. So usually the wave, the, 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 the wave vector of the, of the light is very small compared to the phonon wave vector. So in order to have uh, momentum conservation, if you have a single process of uh, uh, Raman scattering, you will measure only uh, uh, phonons at gamma. So that's the num number one. If you have a single process, what is a single process? It's a process where you create, for instance, just one phonon. So we, you, you need to go close to gamma because of conservation of energy and because usually you use wave vectors, uh, light with very small wave vector. Uh, now, if you look at diamond, you see that here, the, the three optic optical phonons, they are degenerate. That's because diamond is a very symmetric crystal. It's a TD symmetry. Recalling uh, Gustavo's talks, it's a TD symmetry. You in, and in a TD sy system, you can have tri-degenerated uh, uh, states. In graphene, you can't. In graphene, you can't. But here, you can. Okay? So you, in, in, in other words, if, uh, if you do a single process Raman in diamond, you, you just can, you, just, you measure only this phonon he exactly here, and you get this very nice peak exactly at this frequency. So that's the, the a simple way to, sh to check if you have diamond or not, or something that looks like diamond. Okay? So uh, now I, I will start talking about uh, uh, graphite type materials. And this is one very uh, old uh, experimental work about Raman uh, in, in this material. And then they realized that we they have this G peak, and G comes from graphite. So now we know that any sp2 material will, will have this peak. And also they, sa they, they say that this peak was related somehow to defects. So they called the D peak. So I will talk more about this, or because this is a, a single process pro, uh, Raman scattering. So a more recent work. <coughs> uh, here I, uh, we have uh, graphene already in 2009. Uh, and this is a pristine graphene. We see the G peak, also this peak, now we call it 2D, because it has exactly, the da exactly but s uh, approximately double the frequency of the D peak. So we call it 2D. Uh, when they re irradiate pristine graphene, the D peak appears. Okay? So <coughs> what's happening? Ah, okay, here is another uh, uh, review about uh, uh, Raman spectroscopy in carbon, carbon uh, materials, in sp2 materials. So here for graphene, here's for graphite. He is for nanotubes. For nanotubes, we have another uh, other peaks for li like, for example, the radio briefing mode here. This is graphene with defect, so we see a very strong deep peak, and uh, another kind of of, of um, carbon materials, including uh, amorphous carbon. And this is a uh, we know this is sp2 amorphous carbon because of the G peak. Okay. Uh, okay. So. What's going on here? First, we need to recall the, the, the graphene electronic structure. Everybody already knows that we have in these uh, direct points the structure that looks like two cones like that. So we can, and also we, we need to see the phono dispersion of graphene. And here, because graphene is not TD, it's GCH, like we, we learned this week. So the symmetry is not so high. So we don't have it try degenerate phonons here. We have this B degenerate phonon and this uh, mono degenerate here. And, and Gustavo Cansado also told us that for symmetry, we know that this is only visible by infrared absorption, and this is only vi visible by Raman. So the G band is a single, uh, is a single process that comes exactly from these uh, two degenerate phonons here. Okay? 
So we can understand in this way. Uh, you uh, excite your electron to here, you create a phonon with a zero moment, and then you have the scattered light, okay? But today, I, I will not talk much about this. I will about talk about double resonant process. Double res resonant process are these guys here. So for instance, I will start with this one. We can now excite the electron here, I can create now a f this phonon. This phonon do does, doesn't have a zero momentum. It has a large momentum. And then can annihilate the el electron hole pair, and then I, create and, and I, I, I can create another phonon. So here I have two phonons. One has uh, plus Q momentum. The other one has minus Q momentum. So that's why we call it a double resonant. Uh, it actually, it could be double or triple resonant. I won't go in this detail, okay? But it's a second order process that can be double or triple resonant. What about the D-peak? In the D-peak, you have almo almost the same picture. We have a, a phonon with minus a, a plus Q uh, momentum, and then the, 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 the electron can be scattered back to here uh, by a, a defect. One of the scattering is an electron phonon scattering, the other one is electron defect scattering. So that's why we always have, uh, we just have this if you have some, ki some kind of disorder in our, in our system. Any kind of disorder can, can, can give rise to this kind of peak. And that's why uh, this peak has twice the frequency of that, because here I, I, I am uh, measuring a, a, a Q momentum phonon in Two, two Q momentum phonons, and here just one, okay? There are also these peaks that they are not so intense, but they appear where the scattering uh, uh, occurs inside the, the cone in the, in, in the electronic structure. So that's uh, the model that uh, was actually proposed, first, firstly proposed in this very nice paper, uh, paper by Thompson and, and Stefan Reich, where they, they they, they were the first to get the right mechanisms and the first to see that the important thing to understand the D peak and the 2D peak is to take attention in the momentum conservation, okay? But uh, it was in, in, in 2000 and even ten, uh, more than 10 years later, uh, after this paper, they have some calculations here, but that there was not a very how can I say, accurate and detail, detailed calculation about that. So we did that. I did in collaboration with uh, Michele Lazzari and Francesco Mauri. They, at the time, they, they, they were at the, uh, in Paris. So we did a very detailed calculation. Uh, the first thing that we need to consider all, all possible processes, because here, uh, in this picture, I, I just... Uh, give an example of, of one kind of process, but you can have uh, several kind of process. For instance, you can have uh, the scattering of two electrons or the scattering of two, two holes. Or simultaneously, you can scatter one electron and, and, and one hole. So we, we consider in our calculation all kind of processes. Uh, and we did, uh, for the first time, a very careful calcul calculation considering how the matrix elements that are important and also taking very care and have a good description of the electronic and of the phonon uh, uh, properties. So these ele matrix elements, they are related to uh, these uh, processes here. For instance, I, I, I have an, an element, uh, a matrix element for the excitation of the electron hole pair, other one for for electron phonon scatter and so on. So for each of these steps, I have a different matrix element. Okay. So why is the uh, intervalley scattering larger than the intravalley scattering? Because the, the electron phonon coupling close to the K point is larger than the the electron phonon coupling close to the gamma point. Okay, uh, we, we can we will come back to that later. But that is the short one answer. Okay, so uh, now uh, we we calculate that we uh, we take care of 
have a very good description of the the electronic structure because we are not when 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 you do uh, this process here, we are no longer close to the to to the Dirac point here, so that we don't have any more linear dispersion. So we we did uh, a DFT calculations with many body corrections, and then we fitted. A, a tight binding to this, a tight binding model for this very accurate calculation. Also, we need a very good description of the phonons. Uh, here e is, is our calculation, and uh, you see that, for instance, here, e e e e this, this dotted point are the DFT calculation, and this orange line is the GW calculation. So close to the key point due to, to to some aspect of that uh, I won't be able to, to talk lo a lot about it, there is a big difference between the two calculations. So here we need to take care, so we have uh, GW corrections uh, uh, close to the K point to have a good description of the phonons also. So with, uh, with all this care, we can uh, have a good description of the process. Also the other thing is that we have here this broadening parameter. This is an energy, and this is related to, to the inverse of the lifetime of these processes. We calculate it explicitly, uh, considering scattering by electron phonon or electron defects uh, uh, operators, and, and this is also very important to have a good description of this term. Uh, then we uh, compare uh, our calculations with uh, measurements. This is the measurements by uh, the Immetro uh, 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 group in, in Rio de Janeiro. Uh, the first author is Erlon Martins Ferreira. And uh, first, we don't have the G band because the G band is not a, 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 a second process order. So we, don't, we didn't calculate in, in, this, in this paper. We calculate all the, uh, uh, the double resonance process. Look at these peaks. Th those, those three peaks, they are due to two phonons, okay? Uh, and there is not one single uh, adjust adjustment parameter in this calculation. The only thing that I adjust is the, the, the intensity of the 2D peak experimentally and theoric theoretically. And that uh, we have a very, very good agreement, okay? Uh, there is a, a disagreement in frequency, this is due to the, uh, the, the inaccuracy in the phonon calculation. This, is, this, 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 this agreement is of the order 40 centimeters to, to minus one. 40 centimeters to minus one correspond to milli electron volts. So it's very difficult to, to have phonon calculation with occurrence in the order, order best than milli electron volt. And here we have another, uh, when, when we compare the intensity of those defect peaks with the two phonon peaks, we have one, one adjustment parameter, which is how much the, the hopping parameter changes when you put a defect. So uh, we have uh, here just one parameter to fit the relative intensity of this peak with this. We also compared our, our results with uh, Andreas Ferrari's uh, paper. Uh, here I want to show a your attention because, for instance, in the 2D peak, in our calculation and the measurements, they, it's very uh, symmetric, it's, it's, it's very close to a Lorentzian, and, uh, but for the, uh, here, it's no symmetric for the, for the calculation or for the experiment, so we have a very, very good agreement also. However, <coughs> okay, okay, later I come back here, now I go to the little prince. It's for our, our for the theoretician, it's very nice to have good agreement with the experiments, of course, we need that, but that's not the most important prob probably. What we need to, to know where if you have some, some curve that we calculated with our model, what's uh, inside this? That's what we, we, we want to know. We want to know some things that maybe it's not so, so easy for the experimentalist to measure, and maybe in our uh, model, it's easy to, to change. So basically, we, we want to show what's in inside the, 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 the curve that we calculated. And that, as I think that's a job that we theoreticians have, 
not just to do a nice calculation. No, my, my calculation, agree, if it experiments, I'm, I'm good. No. What, what do you have more to, to, to tell? Because uh, if only the only thing that you do is agree if the experiments, you don't, you, we don't need the calculation. So um, it's kind of obvious, but as, uh, I think it's a, a nice uh, uh, point for the students. Okay, so for instance, we can now look exactly where these uh, peaks come from. So the, the 2D peak, for instance, they, there are two phonons from here, and the 2D prime peaks, two phonons from here. So this is related to Alexandre's uh, uh, questions. So here, the electron phonon coupling is much larger than here, and that's the reason because the 2D peak is much larger than the 2D prime peak. So now it's mu much easier to us to understand the data because you can look uh, of the exactly the phonons that create these peaks, and they we can learn a lot of physics with that. For instance, we can we can understand why the this peak is uh, dispersive, in the mean, meaning that when you change the laser energy, you, you, you change the position of the peak. I'm sorry I, I didn't quote here, but this is the work by uh, Daniela Mafra done in, in Marcos Pimenta's group. I, I keep forgetting to put the reference of this paper, but it's a, a paper by Mafra and Pimenta. So uh, this is experimental paper, and now it's very easy because when, when you, you have your uh, cone, if you change the, the, the laser energy, you, know, you, you, you are now uh, exciting e electron hole pairs in different points of the cone. And then you are uh, uh, scattering with different uh, values of uh, uh, phonons with different values of wave vector. So this will, will change the frequency you are measuring. So uh, what's nice about double resonance is that now you can measure things that are, that are far from the gamma point in some case. So here, the first, uh, uh, the, the single order process only measure this phonon. I, with a double resonance, I can uh, measure several phonons uh, uh, in, 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 this, uh, in this, this, those branches here. So we have uh, more possibilities with this kind of process. Also, we can look exactly what are the, phon what the phonons that take part in the process. Here, I, I plot the, 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 the Raman intensity, but usually we plot Raman intensity as a function of uh, Raman shift of, of the frequency, basically. Okay? But here, I plot Raman intensity as a function of the wave vector. So I, we have, because it's a two-dimensional mat material, we have these this, this nice maps that show us uh, in each direction the, the bands will we, we appear. Okay? So this is very useful to understand better the, 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 the problem, the experimental problem. So now I will give some examples of in, in other works where we use our methodology to uh, collaborate with experimentalists and to uh, get uh, some uh, conclusions. So uh, this is the, this is this band here. So this is the most, most intense band in pristine graphene. And there are also this other one here. Okay, so now you, we will talk about that. So uh, by the time uh, we did this work, there was a PRL by, also by, 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 by Dania Daniela Mafra, but at the, the time that she was a student in, in Mildred Dresser House Group in, in MIT. And they, they, they wrote a PRL saying that this peak has due to two sub-peaks, and one of these sub-peaks uh, uh, was non-dispersive, in the sense that it not change uh, uh, frequency when you change uh, 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 laser energy. So they, they claim it that one of the sub-peaks here was due to two uh, phonons exactly at the k-point. And if you look, at momentum and energy conservation, that would be possible. You could have a peak from two phonons here that would explain uh, this. However, the first thing that, uh, so uh, this is the, 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 the experimental work was done mainly by Patrick e. May. At the time, he was a PhD student at Janina Mauchus uh, uh, group in Berlin. I think it's Berlin. Uh, and then, first thing that Patrick measured with a larger 
laser energy than the people in MIT have done. And then, 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 you, then you see that experimentally, so you see, first, one, first thing, you have two soup peaks, that's okay. And experimentally, they are both dispersive. So experimentally, that's a fact. That you have two soup peaks, and they are both uh, dispersive, okay? And now we uh, propose uh, uh, the origin of those peaks. Th those peaks are what we call combination modes peaks, because we have phonons with same, same wave vector, but we from different branches, meaning different frequencies. So we have a combination of a phonon from here and a phonon from here, in this case. Okay? And then we can have several other combinations, but in this case, we have uh, what we call a D, Phono and a D prime prime phono, okay. And with this, we explain because now, if we take in this k gamma direction or in the km direction the same branches, the, the the frequencies is very different. You can you can tell just by li looking at this page. You have some some this frequency with that or this frequency with that. The values. Uh, the, 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 the frequency of the band will be different. So that's the reason we did the calculation. So here we have uh, in green my calculations. So we have an impressive good agreement. I, I'm, I must secretly tell you that in this case we have some cancellation of errors and that's because the, the, the agreement is so per perfect that that happens to any theoretician. So be careful. So if your agreement is so good, you, 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 you need to be suspicious. In this case, we have some cancellation of errors. Okay? But anyway, we can, we can explain exactly the origin of this uh, band that we today call D plus D, pro D plus G prime prime, because it's a combination of these two phonons. Uh, and also, it's interesting. That's something that the, it's very hard. I, I never say something that the, the, experiments, the experimentalists don't do. Because this guy, they, they, this, the experiments guy, they are so smart, then I say, don't. They, they can do that, and tomorrow they, they will do. So I say, something that maybe is too hard for them to do today is, for instance, to turn off interference, quantum interference, in, 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 the, in the physical process. Maybe, it's, I don't know if one day they, they will do that, maybe not, but uh, they are very smart, I don't, I'm not sure. So, for instance, I can uh, hear. I'm I'm uh, summing uh, different matrix elements. Th those are numbers, uh, complex numbers. So they have a phase. So I can have quantum interference. And in the end of the process, I will sum these numbers for uh, in our uh, Brillouin zone, and then I will squ uh, squ squ square that to get a real number, and this will be the the Raman intensity. But when I, I'm calculating, I have uh, uh, quantum phases that that can be that can interfere. I can very easily in, in, in the in the calculation turn off the, the quantum interference. I can just instead of summing the complex number, I can take the the modulus of the numbers and then sum them. In this way, I can uh, theoretically turn off the quantum interference. Also, I can do the calculation without uh, considering the the matrix element. So it's what we we call a constant matrix element calculation. So this is the, the actual uh, calculation, the, the, the good calculation. If I turn, uh, turn off interference, I have this. If I, if I take constant matrix elements, I, I, I take this. If I do both, turn off interference and take a, a constant matrix, I, take, I, I have this. And this is exactly here, the K point. So this is the point that the people at MIT claim to be uh, uh, responsible for this peak. And what, what, what I have in this calculation is only energy and momentum conservation. So if, if you take only momentum and, and energy conservation, I, you see the, this point. If you do the correct, correct calculation, it disappears. So this also is also related to what, to what Gustavo said in, in his uh, course. Uh, the symmetry may, t may tell you what cannot happen, but sometimes may be uh, uh, allowed by, s by symmetry. This, ca this case is not exactly symmetry, but, but there, is, there is an analogy. This case is allowed by momentum and energy conservation. And some several processes in physics 
uh, may be allowed by momentum and energy conservation and, and may not happen. In this case, because the, the, the of, of the matrix element calculation, okay? Okay, another uh, example of uh, application of our methodology. Uh, this is a very, very nice experimental work done b basically by Christopher Neumann in, in the Christoph Stumpfer group, uh, also, also from Germany. Uh, they did several beautiful uh, experimental results. I just, uh, I, I don't have time to, to give all the details of the work. I just give you a glance of the, the of my my participation, my theoretical participation. So basically, they have uh, this substrate, the morpho substrate, okay, and uh, here they put uh, boron nitride in one part of the substrate, and above that they put graphene. So graphene in the p in the part one is uh, in a very flat substrate, which is uh, boron nitride, and here. He is in a very half substrate, which is a morpho silica. Okay, so then now they start taking a confocal Raman spectrum. You can uh, focus your your uh, uh, laser in a small part of of the of the sample, and you can locally uh, tell what is the Raman spectrum. So, for instance, here in red is in the part two, and rear here in blue is the in the part one. What we see is that this 2D band is much uh, broader here than here. And you can do nice maps. Taking here I just show two spectra, but you can do maps going in several points of your sample. And you could can do, for instance, several points. Uh, all the, the, the red points here are in the half part of the, the, the sample. All the blue points here I is in the, the flat part. So we see clearly that here the, the width of the 2D, 2D band is smaller than here, okay? So, uh, okay, so here is a histogram of those points here. Uh, what they can do also is plot experimentally the width of the 2D, 2D band as a function of the area of the 2D band. So they have here, here is the flat part of the, of the sample, here is the amorphous part of the substrate, okay? Uh, so the point was that, that, that there could be several things that contribute to this broadening uh, of the 2D band, okay? In, in my calculation, I can easily do this, this calculation uh, uh, with as a function of area if I increase or decrease in decrease electron phono scattering, okay? So when I do that, and also electron-electron scattering, I can, I can increase. I, I get a curve that has nothing to do with the experimental data, meaning that the, the, the behavior that they see is not related to increasing of the electron-electron scattering or other kind of scattering. It should be uh, 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 related only to strain variations. So our conclusion is that we can you can use uh, the width of the 2D band as a probe for uh, nanoscale strain variations in graphene. Okay, uh, and uh, okay. So here, basically, what I do, I, I, I increase the, this broadening energy, and then I can calculate the width as a function of the area. Okay, another example. My time is running out. This is a this is a very interesting paper. Uh, the experimental part was done mainly by Luciano Moura. Uh, at that time, he was a, 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 a PhD student at Marcos Pimenta Group. Now he is a professor in Universidade Federal de Viçosa. Uh, so we had some uh, carbon nanotubes with uh, a, a single with enriched chirality. So they do some, uh, some kind of uh, process that can en enrich and have basically some chirality. So here I have the Raman shift of the radio, ra radio uh, briefing mode, mode. And if you compare with the excitation energy uh, that happens here, because you, you see that there is a resonance when you change the laser light. 
So knowing the Roman shift and where this, uh, 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 this, this resonance uh, energies are related to the Van Hove singularities in the carbon nanotubes. So with this two uh, piece of information, we can tell uh, which is the chirality of the carbon nanotubes in this sample. So in, in, in the sample, we have basically 6, 5, and 8, 3 uh, carbon nanotubes. So uh, the, the, the theoretical part was done by Marcos Moutinho. At that time, he was a, a postdoc in my group. Now he is a professor at the Universidade Federal do Rio de Janeiro. So this is uh, the experimental data by Luciano. He changed the, the laser energy. And this is the 2D band that's in graphene is like that. It's a very, in graphene is a very symmetric Lorentzian band. And in carbon nanotubes, we don't see. We, we see some similar aspects that, like that, but not exactly the same. For, for think, we don't have one single symmetric band. We have several sub-peaks, clearly. If you look, for instance, at this red sub-peak, this red sub-peak is not dispersive. But in a way, the average uh, behavior of the bands is dispersive. Okay, so it's similar to that, but there are some important differences. And what we see is that the difference. So this is the theoretical calculation by by Marcos Moutinho. Okay, he did that for a six-five carbon nanotube. So in the calculation, we see some similarity in the sense that also the peaks are not symmetric, and in average, they are dispersive. What's the reason of the difference between this peak in graphene and this peak in uh, carbon nanotubes? The reason is very simple. When you can think about a nanotube as a, a, a sheet of graphene that's hole up. When you do that, you have now quantization in the radio, uh, 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 in the radio uh, direction. So this figure here is the brilliant zone in graphene. In a carbon nanotube, the brillant zone is composed by those lines because we, now you have a uh, one-dimensional system. So, for instance, if you have uh, in graphene this laser energy, you, you measure these phonons this with A vectors in this red region here. But in the carbon nanotube, with the same energy, in, for instance, is this is for the 6,5 carbon nanotube, you only see the parts of this region that, are, that belong to the brillant zone of the nanotube. So you don't see all, all, this, all the, these parts, so you don't see the, the build of symmetry of the 2D peak that you see in monolithic graphene because now you have uh, three, in this case, three sub-peaks, okay? So we can explain, we can also say exactly, this is the electronic structure of the carbon nanotube, we can say exactly what are the electronic processes that are taking part in each of these three, uh, uh, each of these three uh, sub-peaks here, and this could be used, for instance, to, uh, to try to say in an easier way uh, what is the chirality of a, 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 a sample with enriched carbon nanotubes. Uh, well other thing that's interesting is that what when you have uh, uh, just all chiralities in a not enriched sample, what you have you have the sum of, of different lines in our directions here. So you, re you recover back the, the graphene's brilliant zone, and you have back the same nice 2D band. Okay? So this, you, this uh, kind of structure you see only if you have enriched uh, carbon nanotube samples. Uh, OK, I, I, I won't give much detail here. Uh, I uh, another work, this one was in collaboration with my Chinese friends. Uh, uh, this work was one by, by mainly, the experimental work mainly by Xin Kong. He, he is a PhD, stud, uh, PhD student at Ping Hentan uh, Group in, in, in Beijing. Uh, and here, interesting because we look for also for the Ant Stokes. Roman scattering. So, uh, uh, recalling, uh, we can we, when you do Roman spectroscopy, we, you you can create phonons, you or you can also annihilate them. So the ant Stokes uh, spectra comes from the annihilation of phonons. Uh, 
so here are the, 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 the experimental results by, by Shinkong. Uh, one thing that uh, first, usually uh, people plot this, uh, the, the, the Stokes peaks in, in the positive part of, of the graph and the unstokes peaks in the negative part of, 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 the, of the graph. But in this case, we display them in the same graph in order to compare better. Also, what we need to do is increase the intensity of the, of the unstokes peak here in the figure because usually the unstokes peaks are much, uh, uh, much less intense. That the reason for that is that I I usually for, for usual temperatures, the phonon population is small. And if the phonon population is small, it's difficult to annihilate phonons for crea crea creation of phonons that's not uh, a issue. So you can also use, like, like, uh, like Juan Carlos showed us with uh, 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 electron microscopy, we can also use uh, the, the relative intensity of those peaks to estimate the temperature of the sample. This is also done. Uh, okay, so what we see is that, for instance, here, uh, for the G peak, the Stokes and those and Stokes uh, peaks are in the same position, but for the 2D peak, they are not. Okay, and the reason is that, that because this is a single process, so in here, doesn't matter if it's Stokes or and Stokes. I, I am creating on an, an, an annihilating the same phonon, and here I am creating or annihilating different phonons. And uh, it's easy to understand if you look at this figure here, for instance. So here, uh, you can you, you excite the electron hole pair. If you create phonon, you lose energy, so you come to here. If you annihilate phonon, you gain energy, so you come to here. So clearly, with unstokes and unstokes, with one measurement, I measure two phonons, one here and another here. So that's the interesting. I think that's the, the, the main point of this paper, that show that with one measure, you can check two points in your uh, phonon dispersion, okay? If you look carefully of to, the, to the Stokes and Stokes process. Uh, and uh, here is my calculations. That I have a very good agreement with, with uh, uh, experiments. So in, in a way, it corroborates this kind of uh, model to understand Stokes and Stokes of this peak, okay? Uh, now I, I change it just a little bit because now this paper, we don't, don't have a, uh, just, a, a, it's not a, a, just an application of the methodology that, that, that I described for you. This is a little bit different, but with more or less the same ingredients. So uh, this work was done, the experimental work was done mainly by Eliel, Eliel, at the time, he was a, a, a PhD student, also in Pimenta's group. Now, uh, right now, he's working in my group as a postdoc. Uh, he wants to learn some. He's an experimentalist guy, but he wants to to work with theory for a while, then come back to to experimental. So I think that's uh, maybe something interesting. So we are talking about twisted graphemes. People already talk about that here. So we have two. You have two uh, uh, graphene sheets, and you rotate them. For for a certain angle, uh, this this angle is uh, is not it's arbitrary. You you take your sample, you you measure. You have several angles. You cannot control it by by this time very easily. But you just take a lot of sample. You have a lot of angles. Okay. What's the main interest of this is that when you when you have uh, twisted bilayer graphene, you have the singularities in, in your in your uh, dense of states. And the, the position of the singularities depend on the angle. So if you change the angle, you change the electronic structure of your sample. So this is very interesting. For instance, very recently, they, they, they went to an uh, uh, angle of approximately 1.1 degree, and they say superconductivity, because they are changing the, 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 the electronic structure. And then this, in this particular magical angle, these two uh, uh, it's two singular types, singularities coalesce here, but uh, I, I want to talk about this very much today. Uh, okay, so what Eliel did, he did, he did several uh, Hamann measurements in these samples, 
Uh, when it, so this is the G band. This is for one, an, uh, one angle and another, another angle. And uh, there are other uh, peaks, Raman peaks, that only appear if you have twisted bilayer graphene. They are clearly a fingerprint of the twisting. Okay? This was already known. There, there were several papers about, about that. I think that what we did, we could uh, give a, a very closed explanation of the origin of those peaks that appear when you have a given angle. So, uh, so Eliao measured the frequency uh, of these different peaks here, for instance, this one and this one, for several angles, okay? And also here we have uh, some uh, uh, experimental points taken from, from this work, okay? So we have basically, those are all, all the measurements by Eliel. Uh, and now pr the first thing that we, s we, we, we can, how can we, we imagine that? We can uh, think that uh, now when we have a very large unit cell, if we have a very li 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 uh, large unit cell, we will have a folding of the phonons to the gamma point, okay? So if we take different angles unit cell, and now we see how the the two phonons that we call LO and TO, the two phonons that are degenerate in, in the zero, zero degree case, now they will come from, from, from a place that in the monolayer graphene, it was not at the gamma point. So I will fold these points not at the gamma point to the gamma point, and this I can do as a function of angle. When I do the calculation, it's a very simple calculation, it's just take your, your phonon frequency, and you fold them. So also, I, I forgot to tell that the, the theoretical, the, the modeling was done uh, by myself, but now with the very special uh, help from Marcos Moutinho. Uh, so he did that. Im I'll, I'll immediately, okay, Juan Carlos. <coughs> Just a question. So, as a function of angle, when the angle is very small, there is no phonon dispersion. Is what you're saying? No, this uh, this is not phonon dispersion. I take I take uh, what is the, the angle for a given angle? What is the 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 the, the, the f what are the phonons that they are folded to the gamma point? Okay. Uh, so when I go I, w for zero, of course I don't I don't have folding, so I have just the gamma point, uh, uh, the gamma point. Uh, so it's related to dispersion to look like the dispersion, but it's not exactly the same thing. So if you're very close to gamma, I have I very close to, to the place where the the, the genesis was breaking. So I have two phonons with similar uh, uh, frequency, but not exactly the same, and these two phonons are folded to the gamma point. I just was wondering whether for the superconductivity of the, of the bilayer graphene, um, the fact that the phonons get a very, they will be very, very small, is what might help superconductivity itself, besides the uh -huh. high charge density that you get yeah. after the two K points getting together. I'm not sure if, together. if the, the optical phonons are, are responsible. Are, are what I mean, people still don't know which are the phonons that take part? So, well, it it or whether it, it take part? Yeah. Uh, so, uh, mm, okay. The, the, but uh, cer certainly, it's interesting to, to look at of the phonons that I at this particular angle, and I, I think that's not clearly exactly so what kind of mechanism. Uh, and also, it's not clear if th this simple model will happen exactly at this angle. Okay. So it's a very simple folding mo model. Okay. Well. Uh, let's go. So clearly, we see that uh, some uh, of the experimental points come from L uh, LO phonons and other for TO phonons. Here is kind of confusing, but here is very clear. Okay. Also, the other thing is that there are two families of peaks that can be clearly seen by uh, these maps. This map, I vary the laser energy and measure the Roman shift. Here, I see, for instance that there is a resonance here in the G peak 
uh, in, in the twisted uh, band peak, the resonance is at the same place. But here is not. I don't have. A, I have a resonance of the, the twisted uh, peak, but uh, I don't have at the same place a resonance of the G peak. So they have, from the electronic point of view, they clearly have uh, different oranges. Okay. Uh, so we did. Uh, I, I don't have much time now, but what we did, we calculate a kind of joint dance of states. Basically, we calculate what are the dance of states of this point multiplied by this point, okay? In two kind of processes. So here, in black, we have uh, the, the phonal dispersion of one of, of, the, of the layers. And in gray, the phonal, sorry, the electronic dispersion for the other layer. So I can, in principle, have in, in twisted bilayer graphene processes that we have electron phonon coupling from black to black, meaning the same cone, or from black to gray, meaning from one cone to the other cone. And these two cones, they vary with angle, okay? With zero angle, we have a, a certain uh, geometry, but then they vary, for instance, here is the origin, you can see the origin of the electron singularity here, okay? So calculating the, this, just by calculating this density of states, we have uh, these, these uh, joint density of states here, that's defined here, okay? And, it, and, and it, we can see the two main peaks, okay? For the, these two processes, inter, in, in, intralayer and interlayer, okay? So those, those curves are the, uh, the, the energy for these two, these two processes. Now we, we can put these two curves in a map like, like that. So here I have these energies as a function of angle, okay? And then I plot, when I put the experimental data, they fit very nicely. So now we can see the origin of, the, of the, these peaks concerning not only if they come from longitudinal or tangential phonons, but also if they come from interlayer or interlayer processes. So we are uh, proposing an, an another nomenclature. You, uh, the, f the, the, the peak can be L or T, and also can be A or E. So you can have also LE and TA. So here, in this case, I have LO phono, intralayer process. In this case, TO phono, interlayer process, but you can have also uh, other, uh, my, my time is over, but I need to f just uh, give you just one more case. When, 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 uh, when uh, uh, Eliao and Marcos did the calculation, showed me, I said, well, that's very nice, but if this is true, so now if you have graphene over boron nitride, you, 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 you will only see interlayer uh, uh, processes, because you, you see only the process in graphene. So Eliao did the calculate they did the measurements for 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 the boron nitride the peaks are very small but he we can we we uh I'm sorry we can see only uh intra intra layer processor here okay when you have a graphite over over bn over graphite okay so I won't have time for conclusions I just want to finish with a picture that was taken from our campus. Okay, thank you very much for your attention. Is there any question? <laughs> um, so you talked about including electron-electron interactions, electron-phonon interactions in your calculation for the line widths. What about 